Hello, everyone. Hi. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> In the year 1987, a, a momentous event occurred. Uh, I was seven years old, and my mother and I were visiting family and sightseeing in Montreal. But I was insistent, absolutely insistent, that we had to get back to the hotel room for 8 o'clock because, well, something important was happening. Um, <laughs> I was a little bit of a weird kid. I was kind of nerdy. I was a theater kid. You know, I was really into books and stories. And, and uh, two of my very favorite things in the entire world were coming together on television. Television's LeVar Burton, star of the hit series Reading Rainbow. <laughs> okay, big deal. And the syndicated series Star Trek were coming together to form the next generation. Boom. Listen, I was very excited. I, I remember chiding my mother, saying, we have to go, we have to go. We got back to the hotel room. I sat on the bed. I turned the TV on because... Back then, there was no, if you missed it at 8, there was, unless somebody was taping it on VHS, there was no watching the episode again. Um, <laughs> but, but there it was. And that episode was incredible. There was, there was an android, you know, and there was Q, and, and a pretty red-headed doctor, and, and, and just all of these amazing things. But there was something that stood out in that episode for me that I, stayed with me my whole life, and probably affected me in ways that um, I can't even really, well, I'm going to attempt to tell you about it today. But, uh, when we met uh, Data and Riker, we walked into the holodeck. And poof, my mind blown. Because <sighs> what kind of TV shows did they play in the holodeck? Were they TVs on the wall or were they projectors? What, what went on in there? I, I, I mean, did, and this is before really video games. They were just side scrollers at this point in time. I was like, you know, and, and just this unfolding fractal pattern of questions, questions, questions in my little seven-year-old brain. Um, it was kind of a, a big deal. Like many things on Star Trek, one of the great things about the show is that, uh, you know, well, cell phones happened. So, so many things on it seemed so far away when we first saw it, but we're gradually seeing them come closer and, and seeing that they are possible. So flash forward to the year 2002. Uh, I was 22 years old, and actually life was, was pretty great. Um, I'd been working as, a, as an actor for 10 years, and, and I had started writing plays. And the first play I wrote when I was 17, it, 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 people really liked it. It won a Sears Festival Award, and, and, and it got produced in Toronto and in New York. And I found myself at the age of 22 in this kind of great position. Um, I was the youngest playwright in a number of playwrights units at Factory Theatre in Toronto, at a fellowship uh, with uh, the New Voices Fellowship at Ensemble Studio Theatre. And, <laughs> and basically, um, I wrote a lot of plays. So at this point in time, in 2002, I'd, I'd had a number of my short plays produced. Some of them contained technology, um, because when they asked me what was in my heart, because in playwrights units, they're like, we want innovation, we want your stories, we want, write what's in your heart. Man, I gotta tell you what, projectors and televisions and cameras, that's what was in my heart. I, I couldn't have articulated that, it at the time, but I, I think the holodeck was in my heart. So at the age of 22, I was working on my opus. Um, Millennium Baby, which was a full-length play uh, that took place in the future that was about the beginning of the end of the world. And I, I'm writing it, you know, I, I was connected to all of these incredible playwrights and dramaturgs and artistic directors who were all very encouraging. But the reality was I was writing a full-length play that required a 30-foot screen, 30 minutes of, of, of in professionally produced film content, uh, computer animations, you know, no big deal. Just write a play. So... <laughs> Even though I was in a position where if I, if I had played my cards right and wrote the right kind of play, uh, it would have gotten produced, um, they wanted me to take the tech out. And, <laughs> and I couldn't do it, you know? I, I just couldn't do it. If I took the tech out, it, the, the inspiration was gone. It would just be a family drama set in the future. Who cares? I, I mean, <sighs> but you know, if you want... Uh, to, to succeed in theater. Just succeeding in theater, even on a small scale, is so difficult. The fact that I was, I mean, I had no business writing something that big at that age. Be pragmatic, they said. Write something smaller, write something different. And, um, you know, I, I, I didn't. <laughs> 
Um, my version of being pragmatic, hold on, I'm going to just check this, <laughs> um, was basically taking myself out of theater. Um, when you have a dream and there's no clear path to it, there's no clear way to achieve it, it's a very lonely feeling. When you have access to people who are experts and who can give you advice and, and, and who are, are listening to you and you ask them, how do I do this? And they say no. It's very easy to just like stop and give up on your dream, especially if you have a, a big dream. The word no is an interesting thing because so often you want to just listen to it because it's coming from a good place. And you can hear it in a very grounded way and, and, and obey and, and move on and do something different. But sometimes, no can actually be a, a way to help you push harder, to help you keep going. Because no doesn't always mean no. No can mean, I don't know. I don't know how to do that. No can also mean, I'm scared. I'm afraid. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't understand. No is an interesting word. So like I said, I was pragmatic. I did take myself out of theater and I decided to focus on film and TV production. Uh, my goal was eventually to become a director and producer and I thought it was very logical for me to just go to that area of the industry. So, you know, I worked a lot of production jobs but I still continued to make short films. Uh, this still is from a short called Bayana, directed by Maria Prokopenko. It was a dance film and uh, the dancers were dancing to music that we timed projections to, that was my job. Uh, images of chemical reactions that moved as the dancers moved. Um, uh, another project I did a few years later was called Bad, Bad Reality Producer. Um, I'd been working in reality television at the time, so I had some philosophical uh, statements about reality television. Um, and it's basically a man wakes up tied to a chair uh, with all these cameras on him wondering uh, why this is happening. And the choreography was the steady cam. It was a one-shot steady cam thing, and how we changed the views in the cameras as he's trying to figure out who tied him to the chair. So even though I was doing my day job, working in production, trying to be pragmatic, I was still uh, unable to get away from this vision of a real person inside a mediated environment. So by 2010, I was, you know, I was working, feeling good, but I really wanted to do something different, like I wanted to um, do something innovative but practical, right? Um, at that point I'd worked in animation, live action, reality, I'd been an editor, I'd been a uh, director on a small scale, I'd, you know, I'd worked as a, in concept development fairly extensively. And I wanted to, I don't know, get into this whole thing that was happening, which was uh, in Canada, the funding system was changing, meaning that you could only get funding through the Canadian Media Fund if you had like a second screen. Uh, so there was a need for people who had ideas about, about uh, multimedia or, or things along those lines that I thought that might be a good fit for me. So it was a very pragmatic move when I applied to be a part of the Canadian Film Centre Media Lab uh, at the Mars Building in Toronto. I thought, okay, Vanessa, all right, all right, just go make like an app, you know, make a web series, do something that could be commercialized and, and, and uh, this would be a really good next step in your career. But I didn't anticipate this. The Microsoft Connect. So in, in the fall of 2010, there was a, a buzz going on on the internet. Um, within the open source communities, uh, they, were, they were talking about this device, which is just an Xbox peripheral. You put it in front of your television and you wave your arms around and you can operate an avatar. But what people wanted to do is they wanted to plug it into their computers and program for it. They wanted to do uh, stuff, right? So there was this uh, bounty that got put out on it. A thousand dollar bounty to the person who could hack the drivers of the Kinect. That bounty was then doubled, okay? Then it was doubled again. So four thousand dollars was on the line to the first programmer who could plug this thing in and get, and get a computer to talk to it. Well guys, four hours after this device was released, it was hacked. And, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, 
and a word on that, a word on that. The open source community, I really want to take this opportunity to really give a shout out to the open source community because it gets a bad rap sometimes, but people would just make things and put them online. You could download their code and, and make it go. It was incredible. We saw like uh, people operating puppets, like digital puppets with the Kinect, people doing lightsaber battles, people uh, made of northern lights, like making the Kinect make them uh, be these shifting patterns of light. Just gorgeous, right? It was very exciting. Um, so we decided we wanted to make a prototype with it. That's part of what you do at the Media Lab. You make a prototype. And, um, but the question is how? How do you design for a device that was never intended to be programmed on? How do you even conceive of how to design for something that sees in three dimensions? It sees you uh, by throwing a pattern of light over top of you, invisible light. It's called a, um, uh, oh, of course, I'm going to blank on this, uh, <laughs> structured light array, which is a beautiful phrase. And it sees you as a three-dimensional point cloud in space. So, you know, you take that three-dimensional information, you can put it in a 2D environment, you can put it in a 3D environment, you can do all sorts of things with it. But just a challenge, just to try to figure out a language to express what you wanted to do, right? So, we ended up going with a 2D environment. Uh, open Frameworks, again, open source community, I give you props. Uh, and we made Heart of Stars, which is a, was a five-minute narrative play space where people find themselves floating in space and you can actually interact with stars and form galaxy forms around your hands. And it was quite beautiful. So we noticed something about this, that uh, an emotional experience happens when you look at an avatar of yourself um, and, uh, and it's like looking into a magic mirror, right? We noticed, Su Ching and I, my, my, my co-creator, when we were playing with it, because gaming with the Kinect, no offense, Kinect, it kind of sucks. You, you, you sort of need to have a button, like a haptic response. So when you're just waving around, it's, it doesn't feel that good. But what feels good is when you can see, like we would both stand on this yoga mat in this yoga game, and, and our bodies, instead of doing yoga, because, <laughs> and your, bo your bodies would join. And it was this incredible thing because you'd see it and you'd feel it. So we're like, there's something going on here that's quite special. Now, Su Ching wanted to focus on sort of medicinal applications to this. Um, and I was really looking at it and going, this is a production tool. I don't know how, but this is a production tool. And I wanted to apply it to live production. Um, and I was looking for anyone who saw in it what I saw. That's when I met this woman, Alison Humphrey. Uh, so Alison Humphrey is a master's student here at York, but not at the time she wasn't. I met her at a very nerdy conference at the CERT Center and we immediately got on like a house on fire. Now just to put her in context, I have a big vision. I, I heard about her before I met her. I heard about this woman who wanted to do uh, motion capture theater to put actors in a Vicon system on stage. That's what they used to make Gollum. Like this, this, so much money and so just like, how do you even do that? But she was looking for people to help her make that happen. And so when we met, got on like a house on fire, we applied for a grant together within a week of meeting each other and this great creative partnership was formed. Um, I also met this guy at a nerdy conference, uh, Pascal. I met him at the X Summit conference, and he was demonstrating. He's an actor, but he's made a career out of uh, acting in video games, and he was, he was demonstrating um, some of the technology and just had so many good things to say. So I went from having no one to standing on a platform that doesn't exist with one or two other people. And the thing about that is you may be standing on something that doesn't exist with nobody to tell you how the, how the heck you're going to move forward, but at least you're holding hands with somebody. Find your collaborators. I have been in all sorts of different collaborative situations. And when you find somebody who knows what you want, who understands what you're going for, that is rare and special, and it doesn't get enough, uh, enough props. Because um, when you have at least one collaborator who really gets what you're trying to do, then all of a sudden it's all possible. So here we are, last year, 2002, 2012. Um, <laughs> Allison had come to York to do her master's, so I figured I wasn't going to see her for two years. And I was doing an arts residency at a place called Site3, which is uh, this kind of amazing group of like Burning Man people. And I was working on my infrared visual stuff. Um, also, uh, she had been talking to York about what she wanted to do for her thesis, and she wanted to do motion capture theater. So they were like, we don't know how you're going to do this. So a conversation began where she was like, well, I have this woman who knows we've been working together. And, and then we spoke to Don Sinclair, who's a digital media prof here, and he was on board. So all of a sudden, we found ourselves in a position to actually move forward with a project. 
The show was called A Midsummer Night's Dream. And what Allison wanted to do, which I totally thought was brilliant, was not hide the technology at all, to create a space on stage where technology equals magic, where the fairies are, are wielding it with their hands. And because of the research I'd been doing, uh, and I'd sort of moved away from the Kinect, uh, we were able to come to a space kind of between the extreme point of the Vicon system and, uh, and the consumer level point of the Kinect to basically uh, move forward with this production. And what a gift that was. These guys right here are the digital media team that came together that became my team this year when we were working on this. This is <laughs> Denise, Lelaine, Asaf, Shanae, and Reese, and I just want to really acknowledge them. They built a show control system from scratch. I gave them, them an impossible ask, ask, and they jumped in with both feet. Many of them had never even been involved in theater before. Um, not only that, but we had the support of the design students in the theater, the administration, um, and this entire, like, I, I'm talking over 100 students who are working on this show at York. Um, and, and people were just, they didn't know what we were doing, but, but, but they, 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 they went with it. Um, also, we had external collaborators because, uh, you know, we wanted to give Bottom a digital donkey's head. So through the, using the Dynamics technology, uh, through uh, our connections at the CERT Center, we were able to produce this, uh, this donkey head that, that moves perfectly to Adam when, when he's performing Bottom. Um, and we also worked with some uh, external artists because if you're going to have a, a, basically a kind of a half holodeck on, on stage and you're projecting all of these magic effects, you need to kind of have a background for it, and so just incredible, uh, incredible work was done by people across institutions, public and private, uh, even not just in Toronto, but, but around the world. People really caught the wind of this project and came together and, and really supported it. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's up now, um, it's actually closing tonight, and it's been a really incredible journey. Um, not only uh, has it been a great uh, experience for uh, people across departments, like right here, we have theater kids and design kids, uh, an actor, we have a kid from computer science, we have you know, the digital media team as well. The fact that people really rallied for this, I, I can't even express. It's the realization of a dream. So. What happens? when suddenly you realize that there's hundreds of people standing on this invisible platform with you. <laughs> the feeling is incredible because it goes from being intangible and nothing to being something that's made of people. It's made of mistakes and victories. Um, it's made of the word yes, and it's made of the phrase let's do it. Um, so we don't have the holodeck yet, <laughs> like we don't have it, but the tools are there, I promise you. The tools are there to actually build this thing. And the people who have come together for this project, not just here in New York or in Toronto, but around the world, and the projects that are now on the horizon because, because we did this, because we just kind of tried it. Um, all those people are actually going to take these tools that exist and put them together and build the platform. So to paraphrase Shakespeare, together we're going to discourse wonders. And I really look forward to whatever's going to happen next. And perhaps one day we will all stand on a holodeck together. Thank you. <laughs>